as a Cornell Jones to Rashad Ross. Touchdown pass. Touchdown to Fickers. This is the XFL. Hey everybody, Nick here with the Wednesday night XFL podcast coming to you live from the XFL Lake House, and I'm joined in person by Logan. How's it going, Logan? XFL! 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 You can follow us on Twitter at XFL Wednesday, and then we also have a sister podcast, Killing for Sports, where you can listen to us review a lot of horror movie pod... a lot of horror movies, such as... Sleepaway Camp, The Langoliers, and Christmas Evil. We'll go ahead and get things started. Uh, what a great first week of the XFL 2020 season. It exceeded expectations. Um, a consistent audience, um, entertaining games, good quarterback play in some games. <laughs> um, it was great. Ratings were great. Um, I'm very anxious to see week two, and I hope everything keeps up. Yeah, I would say that um, it definitely was a lot of fun, and I'm very excited to go to another game since I am a DC Defender season ticket holder. I will be going to <clears throat> the next game on... Not this week, but the follow a uh, few weeks down the road. Uh, week the, five. Yeah, week five, March eighth, Battle Hawks at the Defenders. Um, but let's go ahead and review what happened in week one, and we'll start with our game, DC Defenders hosting the first ever XFL, uh, 2.0 game. Uh, should we talk about our train ride down there and the guy being like Audi Field? Yeah, so <laughs> we took a train up to uh, Union Station in D.C., and we got on a taxi, and the guy didn't know what Audi Field was. And then he's like, you mean the soccer stadium? I said, yeah, that's what it's called, right? <laughs> and he was, like, stunned that something was going on. Yeah. Uh, so we got there, and we had uh, field passes for being season ticket holders, and I, th I thought it was great. Yeah, we ran into the son of the man that runs it all, Shane McMahon. Shane O'Mac. Along with Vince's right-hand man, Kevin Dunn. And we didn't get to meet him, but we saw him just a little bit uh, from us. Um, the commissioner of the XFL, Oliver Luck. Also known as Andrew Luck's dad. Yeah, and uh, I'm disappointed I didn't get to see uh, Bruce Prichard. <laughs> uh, but it was it was a great environment in D.C. The D.C. fans are rambunctious, and I would say Audi Field is a great place to watch football in. It's a soccer stadium, but... These DC fans are nonetheless nonetheless crazy about football. Um, and the field holds at what, a capacity of 20,000 and it ended up with 17 one. So, I mean, they're very close to selling it out. And by Ticketmaster, it was a sellout. But the rest of those tickets were resells that didn't resell. So, I mean, nonetheless, an, a very great display of... Um, fanism i guess you would say right um we had the first row on the uh right the, behind the field goal post yeah south side right behind the field goal post and we found ourselves banging on the uh the thing right below us which we did not know is a digital scoreboard um in aldi field and uh but we made a lot of noise so much so that we caught the attention of a security supervisor with like six minutes left in the fourth and you know came in there's no fun police try to tell us that we would have to pay them money if we broke it which doesn't make any sense 
Why? How would we break it by banging on it? Doesn't it, we were treating it like a Ring of Honor show, <laughs> and like the players were into it, and like they were like telling us to get louder, and then this security guy ruined it. But um, nonetheless, other than that, it was fun. Other than the dickhead that told you, "Oh, you in a rush?" when you were trying to get to your seat. Yeah, like if if you're gonna stand there and not let people get past you, unless someone has to say, "Excuse me." You're the fucking dick. I'm not the fucking dick. <laughs> so, in terms of gameplay, the first half was um, very defensive-oriented, I would say. A lot of three and outs. Um, the first quarter, I would say, Seattle definitely had DC's number when it came to offensive plays. Um, they drove it down the field. Uh DC just couldn't run the ball. We didn't we didn't do enough passing. We did too many trick plays. Could not stop Kenneth Farrow. Yeah. Um, so in the first quarter, it was 6-3 Seattle. Uh, s- the second quarter, um, a little more of the same. Uh, ended up being 13-12. After a record 55-yard long field goal. Which is the new XFL field goal record. Right, and that was done by uh, DC's kicker. And that? Rossa, Ty Rossa. Ty Rossa. Uh, it's definitely better than who we had kicking this wander, who missed a 35-yarder. Um, <laughs> Rossa was the one that missed the field goal. Really? Yeah. I thought it was But the guy wander. beside us was yelling this wonder, so I think that's why he... I saw seven. I didn't see two. Okay. That no, this this wonder was holding it. I think what confused you was the guy beside us kept yelling, This wonder, make the field goal. Yeah, that's true. Um So after a fifty five yarder, it ended up being thirteen twelve Seattle. But what was interesting was um, DC got the last possession of the half, and when Seattle kicked it off... Well, with about 15 seconds left. With about 15 seconds left, um, and we should explain the rule on how this works. They didn't kick it far enough. I believe it must go to the 20 or the 25. Right. And he kicked it well short. Which led to a gigantic penalty and a momentum shifter as the D.C. defenders got the ball at the Seattle Dragons 45-yard line and didn't have to go far for a field goal. Right. And so with that, in the new XFL, for the love of football, the kicker is on the, the 35 and the other players are on... The other 35, right? Yeah, and I think the ball has to make it to the 20 or the 25. I could be wrong, but... Um... Yeah, so after that, penalty flags. Nobody knows of what's going on. Then you find out, oh, um, because it didn't reach the 20, DC gets the ball on the 45 of the opposing side. <laughs> so, yeah, so that definitely was a moment of changer. I like it. It goes along with the we want high-scoring games. Right. Um, what they're going for. And it kind of makes the kicker even more important than the NFL and such. Like, they have to kick this perfect. Yeah. Um, after halftime, I think things got more under control for DC. Scored 19 points in the third, as opposed to the Dragons, six. Yeah, I guess we should mention that they opened up the... Second half with a tremendous double reverse pass to um, from Cardell Jones to Kyrie Lee, and um, it was funny when we were in attendance. It looked like Lee was running very very slow and uncoordinated, but like when we saw it on TV, it looked a lot better than it did when we were sitting in the stands. But that that got the crowd amped. Um, also, we didn't mention in the first half the block the block punt that sent the stadium into a frenzy. I probably haven't heard a noise like that at a sporting event since probably the Charlotte Hornets playoff game against the Heat when Kimball was going off in the first quarter. 
um, that felt like I was at a playoff game. Like it was crazy when they when they blocked the punt and recovered it. And then we had a another pick six in the third quarter, um, along with a uh, Cardale Jones to Rashad Ross touchdown. That's another Cardale Jones to Rashad Ross touchdown pass. Touchdown defenders. Um, and then in the fourth, scoreless. But that was okay. It was a great game. Strong defense by the defenders to put it away. Our favorite Samoan, um, uh, Qualls, with a huge fumble recovery to lead the um, defenders to the win. Absolutely. Um, and that defense was led by veteran um, Raheem Moore. My cousin. <laughs> he, uh, I, I misspoke last week. I thought that he would had been cut by the defenders. I had some bad info when I saw him out on the field. I was like, oh, there's Raheem Moore. And he definitely helped lead the team. Um, I noticed um, in the fourth quarter about five minutes ago, they called this questionable interference call that kept the drive alive for the Dragons on Lawrence. And... Lawrence, being young, fresh out of college, he's like 24 or 25 out of North Carolina, just had his head down and was upset. And like uh, Raheem Moore and all these other guys and Qualls were going over to him. was like, keep your head up, man. There's more football to be played. And it seemed to inspire them. And um, they got that fumble recovery. And um, that was it. They went into victory formation and won the game. Yep. And uh, D.C. faces... The New York Guardians next week, or this week rather. Yeah. And uh, 2 p.m. on Saturday. Again, the first game of the day on ABC. Uh, that should be... The biggest game to date probably in the XFL. Yeah, I would we'll, say so. We'll go a little more into it a little bit after um, these other games we touch on. Yep, and then the next game that we had on Saturday... The P.J. Walker Show. <laughs> yeah, that nobody expected at all, uh, especially with all the questions around the Roughnecks. Uh, but the Roughnecks came to play, and P.J. Walker came and scored four touchdowns. Yeah, 265 yards, 24, uh, 23 for 39, 103.8 QB rating. I mean, just phenomenal play. I and mean, you just want... And I guess we should mention breaking news: um, the Wildcats fired their defensive coordinator Pepper Johnson, and their defensive captain um, has asked for his release from the team. And we're assuming because they cut his defensive captain, um, it's crazy. Um, I think it's a little bit of an overreaction by the Wild uh, by um, Winston Moss, who obviously does not look like a coach, and it looks like he does not care. <laughs> um yeah i mean i i say it's an overreaction and i don't think the you know even though they lost by 20 the game was a little bit closer than that i don't think the wildcats are that bad and a lot of people were bashing kanoff but i thought kanoff played a very good game like we didn't get to see much of the game we saw a lot of highlights when we got back because we had we had a train ride back, so we were following it along on social media. And from all accounts, like the interception Knopf threw was like a bobble that the receiver could have easily caught. The fumble, yeah, that was oh, – he fumbled. I mean, but outside of that, I don't think he played that bad. No, and I would I would agree because um, he, he went 21 for 40, uh, 200 yards, and had one touchdown. Uh, ended up – needing to be <clears throat> taken out because of injury. Uh, then McClendon came in. Uh, was only one for four, though. I mean... And, and I, had one in. I'm sure you'll agree, agree with me on this, but um, Josh Johnson, whether he played or not, I don't think it would have mattered because the defense couldn't stop anybody. Right. And you just wonder if that if P.J. Walker, is he the real deal or is the Wildcats' defense bad? I guess we'll find out very shortly. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, when they face the, the Battle Hawks. The who, Battle Hawks of who St. actually Lewis. stopped one of the so-called better offenses yesterday. I mean, it looks like the Battle Hacks, <laughs> Battle Hacks, Battle Hacks, <laughs> Battle Hawks have one of the better defenses in the league. Um, 
the I feel like those two games are going to be your games of the week next week. Yeah, I would say so, as well as uh, from the Houston side. Um, like I said before, B.J. Walker having four touchdowns, uh, Butler with one, uh, rushing and receiving, Lewis with receiving, uh, Mobley with a sh- receiving, Phillips with a receiving, uh, Sammy Coates um, only had two receptions for 26 yards. And I think it was more so that they were just spreading this ball around. I mean, you look at it, it's four, four reception, five reception, four receptions, two, two. It seems like everybody touched the ball. Yep. Uh, moving on to the first game of yesterday, Sunday. Thank God we were eating Japanese food at this time. Yeah, uh, the New York Guardians <laughs> crushing the Tampa Bay Vipers 23-3. to And thank God this was not the first ever XFL game because I don't know if people would have tuned in to anything else. Yeah. Because Aaron Murray... If his, this would have been the first game on Saturday, he would have killed the XFL. Right. So it's a good thing that the best games for week one were both Saturday. Yeah. And then Sunday were meh, but everybody already knows that the XFL's good, has good football, good energy, good fans. McGloin looked great. Hell of a show. But... 15 for 29. Only one touchdown, but he played well. I right. mean, he got it in there to where he had a rushing touchdown. And actually, I think the other touchdowns came from the defense. Jamar Summers, the best defensive back from last year's AAF, had a touchdown. Um, social media was a buzz yesterday when Murray was playing bad, and people were begging the Vipers to put in Quentin Flowers. Which they did. And they did, and he played well when he was in. And then they took him out. He had he was one for two passing, which, you know, that's hard to tell. But his rushing, he went five attempts for 34 yards. Like, this guy is a dual threat. He could be your P.J. Walker. Evidently, the Vipers feel otherwise. Uh, Williams for the Vipers was the lone star with six receptions and 123 yards. Um... True still had a touchdown, but Williams seemed to be their best receiver coming out of week one. Um, and I don't know if you feel the same, but I feel the Guardians, I don't know if they're good or not yet. And I say that because the Vipers just look putrid. Right, and I would say going into the week two matchup between the Guardians and the Defenders, Defenders look better against a better team. Agreed. Agreed. In the Dragons. Yes. And I'll say the same for Houston. I think... We'll go into power rankings later, and we don't know what each one will pick when we do our rankings, but I feel we're pretty, probably pretty close to a one and two with those two teams. Yeah. Um, and then we have the last game of the week, uh, St. Louis Battlehawks visiting the Dallas Renegades uh, with the Renegades. Uh, Landry Jones, former Pittsburgh Steeler, uh, was actually cut No hurt. two years ago. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. And then was a construction worker. Yeah. So he didn't start. You know, he didn't play, rather. He suited up. And in his place was Philip Nelson of the uh, San Diego Fleet. Uh, started towards the end after um, Mike. How do you pronounce his last name? Mike, um, in the AAF? Yeah, for the fleet. We were just pronouncing his name yesterday. Wood, um, not Woodward. It's like European. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> we'll find out for you right here. Um, do, 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 Mike. Uh, Mike Berkjoviki. Berk Berkjoviki? Berkjoviki? Berkhead. We'll just call him Berkhead. Berkhead. <laughs> um, yeah. With uh, <clears throat> Philip Nelson starting uh, for the Renegades, it showed that 
he was kind of a <laughs> scared to throw the ball down yeah. the field quarterback. So check check down city. Uh going 33 to 42, 199 yards, one interception, <laughs> 5 yards a pass. Right. Throw the ball, my man. And when he was forced to throw it downfield at the end, he threw an interception. Yep, so they had three field goals. No touchdowns. This team is going to live and die off of Landry Jones. Yeah, um, but I don't think anything will change. You think? I I think... They're going to stick with him? No, I think in terms of winning games... Oh. Nothing's going to change with Dallas. You did call in the power rankings. You said you were not impressed with Dallas and had him at six last week when I wanted to put him at two. Good call. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> St. Louis getting the win, 15-9. Jordan Tamu had a very good game, 20 for 27, 183 pass yards, uh, one touchdown, 108.4 rating. After me bashing him last week and saying that this guy wasn't good, he could he didn't play well when he was at Ole Miss with DK Metcalf and AJ Brown. Well, he proved me wrong. He also had nine attempts rushing and 77 yards. Um, he's a he could be our offensive player of the week. Well, or player of the week in general. We'll go over that in a little bit later. Um, on the defensive side, um, they racked up a bunch of sacks. They had one, two, three, four, four sacks and an interception by a former New York Giants safety, Will Hill, um, who brings a veteran presence. And also had some key punts from Marquette King, who downed Dallas inside their 20 twice. Um, one of the better punters that I don't know why he's not in the NFL. Maybe because he dances and stuff whenever he... Has a good punt. I he's, don't know. He's gotten some flags. Yeah, yeah. He is. Uh, I guess been blackballed by the NFL. I'd love that guy on my defenders team. Yes. So um, I just wonder. <laughs> exactly. Um, Battle Hawks looking like a team to compete in the East. Uh, we have three one and O teams in the East with the Defenders, the Guardians, and the Battle Hawks. Vipers sitting at zero and one. Uh, while in the West, the Roughnecks are the only 1-0 team. Uh, the Dragons, Wildcats, and the Renegades all 0-1. Right, right. Um, also, another interesting conversation that was taken across social media over the past two days is the running aspect of the XFL. As there wasn't many run attempts, and when there were run attempts, nobody really gained many yards. Unless your name's Kenneth Furrow. Yeah. Um, so, is this going to be a thing we see? Or is people still trying to figure out how these other defenses are where you can't, or they're still trying to game plan and, you know, if they're going to try to run a counter run or a toss or whatnot, they don't know what to run because they have no game field of the opposing defenses. Will this get a little better as we go on and you can finally figure out what the weaknesses are in the defenses? Right. Um, so for me, offensive player of the week, PJ Walker. Defensive, Raheem Moore. I'm going to go offense, PJ Walker, and defense. I'm going to go with last year's best defensive back in the AAF for the New York Guardians, Jamar Summers. He kind of had the game clinching touchdown last, last yesterday for the Guardians. I love Jamar. He had a pick six last year for the Detroit Lions in the preseason, and we cut him right after the game. How does that work? <laughs> what the fuck are you guys doing? <laughs> but I will say in, in, in the same sentence that the Steelers also cut uh, P.J. Walker after bringing him in as just a decoy. A decoy to be just for the, before the Lamar Jackson game. And they didn't even have him pass in practice. He just ran around. Yeah. But they may have never used him the right way. June Jones seems to be using him in a way that he should be. Right. Um, With no tight ends. <laughs> so something I want to talk about is uh, our rankings. Last week, we had no idea what to expect going into week one. Week two, we have a little better idea. And I'll go ahead and start off with my number eight, 
which is the Dallas Renegades. Oh. Okay. Number seven, I'll go to the Vipers. They would have been my number eight if I was doing a personal one. Yeah. Uh, well, for me, it, it's it's a toss-up. Is it because of the hype and everything of the Renegades and they have not... It was kind of a disappointment. Right. Um, they scored more points than the Vipers, but I think the Vipers have more potential offensively than the Renegades. If they can just switch their quarterbacks. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um... Number six, I'm going the Wildcats. Yeah, I'll go the Wildcats as well. Oh. I can't put the Wildcats at five. What am I doing? Um, I'll go the Dragons at five. And you know what? I don't think Silver's is that good, but I think they have a defense that could be competitive out in the West. And they have... For Pharaoh and some pretty good receivers, Austin Prohl, um, and they and Trey Williams is not a bad him and um, him and Pharaoh are a very good one-two running back combo. I don't think the Dragons are that bad. Number four, I am going the Battle Hawks. That's fair because we don't know. It's hard to tell with Philip Nelson in there. Yeah. Number three, I'm going to go the Guardians. I think they beat a bad Vipers team. Number two, Houston Roughnecks. And for the second straight week, your number one team in the XFL is the D.C. Defenders. I do believe, biasness aside, I think they got the best all-around team. So, which leads us to our next segment where we do a... We're going to start doing a themed... Um, power rankings. Power rankings related to the XFL. Um, this week is rankings on coaches, um, and if they actually look like a coach or not. Uh, <laughs> so best looking coaches, basically. Um, for number eight, I am going June Jones because <laughs> he looks like he has dementia. Okay. Uh, number seven, <laughs> number seven, I'm gonna go uh, Mark Tressman. He just he looks like a a scientist. Like he just doesn't look like he belongs. Uh, number six, I am going Winston Moss because he threw his whole team under the bus. He threw his whole team under the bus, and it looks like he just doesn't give a shit. <laughs> Number five, I'm going to go with um, Jim Zorn. He just seems clueless. Like, <laughs> they talked about them calling plays all off season, like on the broadcast, and he was like, oh, they can hear our plays in the press conference. Yeah. Uh, Number four, I am going Jonathan Hayes. We're gar- starting to get a little more coach esque in our. And how our coaches look. Right. Uh, number three, I'm going to go Kevin Gilbride. And he looks like the toy from Small Soldiers. He also looks like a grandpa. <laughs> uh, number two, I'm going Bob Stoops. The Dallas Renegades. That's fair. I and there's going to be one or two. And our number one. Pep Hamilton. Man, we're, we have a super big bias for... I think Pep Hamilton, if you give him like two years in the defenders, with the defenders, I think he'll be in the NFL in no time as a coach. He seems like a player's coach that the guys love to play for. Yeah, no, I would say so. Uh, He's an offensive wizard. And so it'll be interesting how things go. Please stop running run plays or these stupid trick plays. Just pass the ball. Cardale, MVP, Cookout Jones. Just needs to throw it to Eli Rogers. Throw it to Rashad Ross. Not Dupree. Not Dupree. Dropped everything. <laughs> Give it to Lee, who barreled down the field. Presley out in the slot or yeah. out in the flat, you know. Presley probably would do more in the pass game than the run game, the way the run block was this week. Right. And I guess we'll jump into our picks for this week. Uh, so I went one and three. You went three and one. Three and one. But it's easy in this league, being so early, it's easy to jump right back in this thing. 
Uh, so with the first game, the New York Guardians going up, going down, sorry, uh, to Audi Field to face the DC Defenders. I'm going DC Defenders 35 17. I'm going to go Defenders 33-21. Um, bold prediction, the Defenders won't lose a game at home all year. Best home field advantage in the league. I agree. Um, next, we got the Tampa Bay Vipers visiting the uh, Seattle Dragons. Um, I think Century Field is going to be freaking nuts. One of the most sold tickets... Season if not, tickets if not the most. Yeah, it was between them and the Battle Hawks. Yeah. Um, dragons are going to kill the Vipers. I agree. Um, I'm going 45 to 3. 23 to 12. Then we have Dallas Renegades visiting the LA Wildcats. It's I got the, the LA Wildcats. This could be backup quarterback versus backup quarterback. It could be no Josh Johnson for the Wildcats and Knopf playing again versus the Dallas Renegades and possibly the model Philip Nelson again. Um, I'm going to take... I see a lot of issues with the Wildcats' defense. I'll take the Renegades in a squeaker. 18 to 14. I have it 9-3. Wildcats. <laughs> then last we have St. Louis Battlehawks visiting the Houston Roughnecks. Battlehawks proving they can uh, do it at home, or sorry, do it on the road against the Renegades. Going to be a very entertaining game with two um, dual threat quarterbacks. Um, I got the Roughnecks this week. PJ Walker's going to go off again. Uh, I give it 45-32. I'm going to say it's going to be our highest scoring one yet with the Roughnecks winning 49-46. to That's going to be a killer. Uh, and like you said, that's definitely going to be the game of the week. I would say neck and neck with the Guardians. The opener, the opener and the closer of the week is going to be the two games you don't want to miss. Right. Um... So, and I, I kind of hate that the Battle Hawks and Roughnecks kind of got the FS1 treatment. Yeah, that's disappointing. Um, but that's also, they're going up against um, Oh, Daytona the Daytona 500. 500. Yeah. yeah, and NASCAR will be on Fox on Sunday, so they're going to have no choice but to run the late games right. on FS1. Uh, so with that, I'm very excited. Are you excited, Logan? <laughs> very much so. Um, I wish we had some Wednesday night football to go against AEW instead of NXT. Um, it's clearly the better of all four of uh, Vince McMahon's yeah, products. XFL is the best WWE product out there by far right now. Correct. Uh, so you can follow us on Twitter at XFL Wednesday, and you can also follow our sister podcast, Killing for Sport. Uh, that is at Kill for Sport Pod. On Twitter. <laughs> Kai and Ty. Um, but thank you again. And uh, good night, Pep Guardian. Good night, Pepto Bismol.